Unraveling the Epstein Enigma, A Life of Scandal, Scorn, and Shadows Jeffrey Epstein, whose full name was Jeffrey Edward Epstein, was an American financier and convicted sex offender. He was born on January 20, 1953, and passed away on August 10, 2019. His life was marked by controversy and legal issues related to his involvement in sexual abuse and exploitation. Epstein initially worked as a teacher at the Dalton School in New York City, despite not having a college degree. However, his career took a different turn after his dismissal from the school. He entered the banking and finance sector, working at Bear Stearns in various positions before eventually starting his own financial firm. One of the most notorious aspects of Epstein's life was his association with a high-profile social circle, which included numerous influential and wealthy individuals. He used his connections to procure and sexually abuse many women and children, often with the assistance of his associates. In 2005, Epstein's legal troubles came to public attention when police in Palm Beach, Florida, initiated an investigation into allegations that he had sexually abused a 14-year-old girl. Federal officials identified a total of 36 girls, some as young as 14, who were allegedly sexually abused by Epstein. In 2008, he pleaded guilty and was convicted in a Florida state court on charges of procuring a child for prostitution and soliciting a prostitute. His plea deal was widely criticized for its leniency, and he served a short prison sentence of almost 13 months with extensive work release. Epstein's legal issues continued in 2019 when he was arrested again on federal charges related to the sex trafficking of minors, with cases in Florida and New York. However, before facing trial, he died in his jail cell on August 10, 2019. The medical examiner ruled his death as a suicide by hanging. Nevertheless, there has been significant public skepticism and numerous conspiracy theories surrounding the true cause of his death. Due to Epstein's death, the possibility of pursuing criminal charges against him was precluded, and all criminal charges were dismissed by a judge on August 29, 2019. Despite his death, the legal consequences extended to others associated with him. Ghislaine Maxwell, a British socialite who had a decades-long association with Epstein, was convicted in 2021 on U.S. federal charges of sex trafficking and conspiracy for her role in helping Epstein procure girls, including a 14-year-old, for child sexual abuse and prostitution. Early Life Jeffrey Edward Epstein was born on January 20, 1953, in the Brooklyn borough of New York City. His parents Pauline, Paula, Stolovsky, 1918-2004, and Seymour George Epstein, 1916-1991, were Jewish and had married in 1952 shortly before his birth. Pauline worked as a school aide and was a homemaker. Paula was a wonderful mother and homemaker, despite the fact that she had a full-time job, according to a former childhood friend of Epstein's. Seymour worked for the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation as a groundskeeper and gardener. Jeffrey was the older of two siblings. He and his brother Mark grew up in the working-class neighborhood of Seagate, a private gated community in Coney Island, Brooklyn. Epstein was referred to as Bear by his parents, while Mark was known as Puggy. Neighbors described the Epstein family as being so gentle, the most gentle people. Epstein attended local public schools, first attending public school 188, and then Mark Twain Jr. High School nearby, and usually earned money by tutoring classmates. Acquaintances considered Epstein sweet and generous, although quiet and nerdy, and nicknamed him Epi. He was just an average boy, very smart in maths, slightly overweight, freckles, always smiling, a female friend later said. In 1967, Epstein attended the National Music Camp at the Interlocked Center for the Arts. He began playing the piano when he was five, and was regarded as a talented musician by friends. He graduated in 1969 from Lafayette High School at age 16, having skipped two grades. 
Later that year, he attended advanced math classes at Cooper Union until he changed colleges in 1971. From September 1971, he attended the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences at New York University studying mathematical physiology but left without receiving a degree in June 1974. Jeffrey Epstein's career took a significant turn in the mid-1970s, and his path began with a teaching position. Teaching, in September 1974, Epstein started working as a physics and mathematics teacher for teenagers at the Dalton School, which is located on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. At the time, Donald Barr served as the headmaster of the school until June 1974. It's worth noting that Barr was known for making unconventional recruitment decisions, although it remains unclear whether he had a direct role in hiring Epstein. Approximately three months after Barr's departure, Epstein began his teaching role at the school, despite lacking formal credentials. Epstein was known for his charismatic personality and his tendency to interact with students more as friends than as their teacher. However, during his time at Dalton, there were allegations of inappropriate behavior towards underage female students. He was said to pay constant attention to them, and there were reports of him attending a party where young people were drinking, which raised concerns. Former students also mentioned witnessing him flirting with female students. During his time at Dalton, Epstein crossed paths with Alan Greenberg, the chief executive officer of Bear Stearns, a prominent investment bank. Greenberg's son and daughter were attending the Dalton School, and his daughter, Lynn Coppell, played a role in connecting Epstein to her father. Coppell advocated for Epstein during a parent-teacher conference, which influenced Greenberg's decision. In June 1976, Epstein was dismissed from the Dalton School for poor performance. Shortly thereafter, Alan Greenberg offered him a job at Bear Stearns, marking a crucial transition in Epstein's career from teaching to the world of finance. This opportunity at Bear Stearns would eventually set the stage for his future endeavors in the financial sector. Jeffrey Epstein's career in the banking and finance sector began at Bear Stearns in 1976, and it went through several stages. Entry-level position, Epstein started at Bear Stearns as a low-level junior assistant to a floor trader. This was his initial role within the company. Advancement, he quickly moved up the ranks, becoming an options trader and working in the special products division. This division often handles complex financial products. Client advisor, Epstein transitioned to advising the bank's wealthiest clients, including individuals like Edgar Bronfman, who was the president of Seagram. He provided these clients with strategies for tax mitigation, showcasing his financial acumen. Limited partnership, by 1980, just four years after joining Bear Stearns, Epstein achieved the status of a limited partner within the firm. This was a notable milestone in his career, signifying his growing influence and importance within the company. Departure In 1981, Epstein left Bear Stearns. According to his own sworn testimony, he departed due to a Reg D violation. The specifics of this violation are not provided in the text, but it led to his departure from the company. Despite his abrupt exit from Bear Stearns, Epstein maintained close relationships with some of the bank's key figures, including Jimmy Kane, who later became the chief executive officer. Epstein's skill in dealing with wealthy clients and complex financial products was acknowledged and praised by Kane. Notably, Epstein continued to be a client of Bear Stearns even after his departure from the company and this association persisted until Bear Stearns experienced a collapse in 2008. Epstein's career in finance and his connections within the industry would play a pivotal role in his future endeavors and controversies. In August 1981, Jeffrey Epstein founded his own consulting firm called Intercontinental Assets Group Incorporated, IAG. IAG specialized in assisting clients in recovering money that had been stolen by fraudulent brokers and lawyers. Epstein referred to his work during this time as that of a high-level bounty hunter. 
He claimed to have worked as a consultant for governments and wealthy individuals to recover embezzled funds. On occasion, he also assisted clients who themselves had embezzled funds. One notable client of Epstein's during this period was the Spanish actress and heiress Ana Obregón. In 1982, Epstein helped her recover her father's lost investments, which had vanished when Drysdale government securities collapsed due to fraudulent activities. During this time, Epstein made claims to certain individuals that he was an intelligence agent. He also possessed an Austrian passport that featured his photo but under a false name. This passport indicated his place of residence as Saudi Arabia. In 2017, a former senior White House official reported that Alexander Acosta, who was the U.S. attorney for the Southern District of Florida and had handled Epstein's 2008 criminal case, had told Trump transition interviewers that Epstein belonged to intelligence and advised them to leave it alone. Epstein was described as being above his pay grade in this context. One of Epstein's notable clients during this period was the Saudi Arabian businessman Adnan Khashoggi. Khashoggi played a significant role in transferring American weapons from Israel to Iran, which was part of the Iran-Contra affair in the 1980s. Khashoggi was just one of several defense contractors Epstein had dealings with. In the mid-1980s, Epstein traveled frequently between the United States, Europe, and Southwest Asia. While in London, he met Stephen Hoffenberg, an introduction that had been facilitated through connections like Douglas Lease, a defense contractor, and John Mitchell, the former U.S. Attorney General. This phase of Epstein's career marked his foray into financial consulting and introduced him to a network of influential and wealthy individuals. In 1987, Stephen Hoffenberg hired Jeffrey Epstein as a consultant for Towers Financial Corporation. This company, unrelated to the one founded in 1998 and acquired by Old National Bancorp in 2014, operated as a collection agency specializing in purchasing debts that individuals owed to various entities, including hospitals, banks, and phone companies. Hoffenberg provided Epstein with offices in the Villard Houses in Manhattan and paid him a monthly salary of $25,000 for his consulting services, which is equivalent to approximately $64,000 in 2022. Under Hoffenberg's guidance, Epstein and Hoffenberg transformed themselves into corporate raiders, using Towers Financial as their vehicle for hostile takeovers. One of Epstein's initial assignments for Hoffenberg was an unsuccessful attempt to take over Pan American World Airways in 1987. They also made a similar unsuccessful bid in 1988 to acquire Emory Air Freight Corporation. During this period, Epstein and Hoffenberg worked closely together and frequently traveled on Hoffenberg's private jet. However, Towers Financial Corporation faced a major scandal in 1993 when it was revealed to be one of the largest Ponzi schemes in American history, losing over $450 million of investors' money. In court documents, Hoffenberg claimed that Epstein was intimately involved in the scheme. It's important to note that Epstein had left the company by 1989 and was never charged in connection with the massive investor fraud committed by Towers Financial. It remains unclear whether Epstein acquired any of the stolen funds from the Towers Ponzi scheme. This chapter in Epstein's career was marked by controversy and financial scandal. In 1988, while still consulting for Stephen Hoffenberg, Jeffrey Epstein founded his own financial management firm, J. Epstein & Company. Epstein claimed that the company was established to manage the assets of clients with more than $1 billion in net worth, although some have expressed doubts about the strictness of the criteria for his clients. The most publicly known billionaire client of Epstein's was Leslie Wexner, the chairman and CEO of L Brands, formerly The Limited Incorporated, and Victoria's Secret. Epstein and Wexner crossed paths in 1986 through mutual acquaintances, insurance executive Robert Meister and his wife, in Palm Beach, Florida. Within a year, Epstein became Wexner's financial advisor and played a significant role in sorting out Wexner's complex financial matters. In July 1991, 
Wexner granted Epstein full power of attorney over his affairs, granting him extensive authority to act on Wexner's behalf. This power of attorney allowed Epstein to make financial decisions, hire personnel, sign checks, engage in property transactions, borrow money, and perform other legally binding actions on behalf of Wexner. Epstein managed various aspects of Wexner's wealth and projects, including overseeing the construction of Wexner's yacht, named The Limitless. By 1995, Epstein had assumed positions as a director of the Wexner Foundation and Wexner Heritage Foundation. He also served as the president of Wexner's property, which was involved in developing part of the town of New Albany outside Columbus, Ohio, where Wexner resided. Epstein earned substantial fees for managing Wexner's financial affairs, even though he was not formally employed by L. Brands. He maintained frequent communication with company executives and was known to attend Victoria's Secret fashion shows. Additionally, Epstein often hosted models at his New York City residence and assisted aspiring models in securing work with the company. In 1996, Epstein changed the name of his firm to the Financial Trust Company and established its base on the island of St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands for tax advantages. This move allowed Epstein to significantly reduce his federal income taxes, with a reduction of up to 90%. The U.S. Virgin Islands served as an offshore tax haven while still offering the benefits of being a part of the United States banking system. This aspect of Epstein's financial management business emphasized his association with wealthy clients and his strategic use of tax structures. Jeffrey Epstein was involved in various media and financial activities during the early 2000s. Bid for New York Magazine, 2003 In 2003, Epstein made a bid to acquire New York Magazine, a prominent publication covering various topics related to the city and its culture. Other bidders for the magazine included Donnie Deutsch, Nelson Peltz, Mortimer Zuckerman, and Harvey Weinstein. Ultimately, the magazine was purchased by Bruce Wasserstein, a longtime Wall Street investment banker, who paid $55 million for it. Investment in Radar Magazine, 2004 In 2004, Epstein and Mortimer Zuckerman made a financial commitment of up to $25 million to finance Radar Magazine. Radar was a celebrity and pop culture magazine founded by Mayor Roshan. Epstein and Zuckerman were equal partners in this venture, while Roshan, as the editor-in-chief, retained a small ownership stake. However, Radar faced financial challenges and folded as a print publication after only three issues, transitioning to an online-only format. President of Liquid Funding Limited 2000-2007 Epstein served as the president of Liquid Funding Limited during the years 2000-2007. Liquid Funding was a financial company that played a pioneering role in expanding the types of debt accepted in the repurchase, repo, market. This market involves lenders providing money to borrowers in exchange for securities that the borrowers agree to repurchase at a later date and an agreed-upon price. What made Liquid Funding innovative was its use of commercial mortgages and investment-grade residential mortgages bundled into complex securities as underlying collateral for repurchase agreements. These complex securities were highly rated by credit rating agencies like Standard & Poor's, Fitch Ratings, and Moody's Investor Service, often receiving a top-tier AAA rating. However, the collapse of such complex securities, attributed to inaccurate ratings, contributed to the downfall of Bear Stearns in March 2008. This event played a significant role in triggering the financial crisis of 2007-2008 and the subsequent Great Recession. If liquid funding had held substantial amounts of these securities as collateral, it could have incurred substantial losses. Epstein's involvement with liquid funding was part of his broader financial activities during this period. Jeffrey Epstein was involved in various investment activities, particularly in hedge funds and startups. Investment in DB's Wern Special Opportunities Fund, 2002-2005 Between 2002 and 2005, Epstein invested $80 million in the DB's Wern Special Opportunities Fund, a hedge fund that specialized in illiquid debt securities. 
In November 2006, Epstein attempted to redeem his investment after learning of accounting irregularities in the fund. At that time, his investment had grown to $140 million. However, the fund declined his redemption request. Hedge funds that invest in illiquid securities often have lockup periods for their investors and require written redemption requests made 60 to 90 days in advance. The fund was ultimately closed in 2008, and its remaining assets, including Epstein's investment, were transferred to Fortress Investment Group in 2009. Epstein later engaged in arbitration with Fortress regarding his redemption attempt, but the outcome of the arbitration is not publicly known. Investment in Bear Stearns High-Grade Structured Credit Strategies Enhanced Leverage Hedge Fund, 2006 In August 2006, around the same time the federal investigation into Epstein began, he invested $57 million in the Bear Stearns High-Grade Structured Credit Strategies Enhanced Leverage Hedge Fund. This fund was highly leveraged and heavily invested in mortgage-backed collateralized debt obligations, CDOs. The fund's leverage ratio was 17 to 1, meaning that for every dollar invested, there were $17 of borrowed funds. An investor who had $57 million in the fund discussed redeeming their investment in April 2007, at a time when the fund's leverage and the CDO market were already under strain. The redemptions and selling of CDO assets triggered a repricing process and a market freeze. The fund collapsed in July 2007, contributing to the eventual collapse of Bear Stearns in March 2008. While it is likely that Epstein lost a significant portion of his investment, the exact amount of his losses is not known. Investment in Israeli startup Reporty Homeland Security, 2015 In 2015, Epstein invested in the Israeli startup Reporty Homeland Security, which was later rebranded as Carbine in 2018. This startup had connections with Israel's defense industry and was headed by former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak. The company's CEO was Amir Eli Hai, a special forces officer, and Pinchas Bukris, a former defense ministry director general and commander of IDF Cyber Unit 8200. Epstein and Barak had a close relationship, and Epstein often provided lodging for Barak at one of his apartment units in Manhattan. Epstein had prior experience with Israel's research and military sector, as evidenced by his visit to Israel in April 2008, where he met with research scientists and visited various Israeli military bases. Jeffrey Epstein was known for his use of concealed cameras in various locations on his properties, which raised concerns about the potential recording of sexual activities with underage girls involving prominent individuals for possible criminal purposes such as blackmail. Some key points regarding these allegations and the use of hidden cameras include Cameras on Epstein's properties Epstein allegedly installed concealed cameras in numerous locations on his properties to secretly record sexual activities. These locations included his private island in the Virgin Islands, his Palm Beach residence, and his mansion in New York. The purpose of these cameras was believed to be for capturing compromising material involving influential people. Wiring of Epstein's private island, Ghislaine Maxwell, Epstein's long-term girlfriend and companion, reportedly informed a friend that Epstein's private island in the Virgin Islands was fully wired with video surveillance equipment. It was suspected that Maxwell and Epstein were videotaping everyone on the island as a form of insurance. Discovery of Hidden Cameras When police raided Epstein's Palm Beach residence in 2006, they discovered two concealed cameras in his home. Additionally, it was reported that Epstein's New York mansion was extensively wired with a video surveillance system. Media Room with Monitoring Maria Farmer an artist who worked for Epstein in 1996, described a media room in Epstein's New York mansion where individuals were monitoring the pinhole cameras throughout the house. The media room was accessed through a hidden door, and it had screens displaying camera feeds. Farmer mentioned that it was evident that private moments were being monitored, with cameras focused on areas like bedrooms and toilets. Allegations of blackmail 
Epstein was accused of lending girls to powerful individuals to gain favor with them and potentially gather blackmail material. The Department of Justice stated that Epstein kept compact discs in his New York mansion safe, with handwritten labels indicating the names of young individuals. These labels suggested that the discs contained potentially incriminating material. Implied possession of blackmail material, in 2018, Epstein reportedly implied to a New York Times reporter, off the record, that he had damaging information about powerful individuals, including details about their sexual preferences and recreational drug use. This suggested that he may have been using such information as leverage. These allegations and the presence of concealed cameras have raised significant legal and ethical concerns. Epstein's actions and their potential implications have been the subject of extensive investigation and legal proceedings. Jeffrey Epstein's legal proceedings and the first criminal case against him involved a series of developments spanning from 2005 to 2006. Initial Allegations, 2005 The case began when a woman contacted the Palm Beach Police Department in March 2005, alleging that her 14-year-old stepdaughter had been taken to Epstein's mansion by an older girl. According to the allegations, the young girl was paid $300 to strip and massage Epstein but left the encounter wearing her underwear. This prompted an investigation by the Palm Beach Police, which included a search of Epstein's home. Undercover Investigation Palm Beach Police initiated a 13-month undercover investigation into Epstein's activities. During this investigation, the police alleged that Epstein had paid several girls to perform sexual acts with him. Interviews with alleged victims, witnesses, a high school transcript, and other evidence suggested that some of the girls involved were under 18, with the youngest being 14, and many being under 16. FBI Involvement As the case progressed, the FBI became involved due to the severity of the allegations. The investigation uncovered evidence such as hidden cameras and numerous photographs of girls throughout Epstein's residence, some of whom had been interviewed by the police. Court documents and Amazon receipt Court documents revealed that during the search of Epstein's home, an Amazon receipt was found containing books related to SNM and erotic topics, raising additional questions about his activities. Grand Jury and Arrest, 2006 In May 2006, Palm Beach Police filed a probable cause affidavit recommending that Epstein be charged with multiple counts of unlawful sex with minors and sexual abuse. On July 27, 2006, Epstein was arrested by the Palm Beach Police Department on state felony charges of procuring a minor for prostitution and solicitation of a prostitute. He was subsequently booked at the Palm Beach County Jail and released on a $3,000 bond. State Prosecutor Barry Krischer convened a grand jury, which returned a single charge of felony solicitation of prostitution based on evidence from two victims. Legal Defense Epstein's defense team included notable lawyers such as Roy Black, Gerald Lefcourt, Alan Dershowitz, and Ken Starr. Linguist Steven Pinker also provided assistance. This marked the beginning of Epstein's legal battles, which would continue with further developments, plea negotiations, and controversies in the years that followed. The Non-Prosecution Agreement, NPA, involving Jeffrey Epstein from 2006 to 2008 was a significant and controversial development in his legal case. Here are the key details. FBI Investigation, Operation Leap Year In July 2006, the FBI initiated its own investigation into Epstein, referred to as Operation Leap Year. This investigation led to a 53-page indictment in June 2007. Plea Deal and Immunity Alexander Acosta, who was the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of Florida at the time, agreed to a plea deal with Epstein. The plea deal granted immunity from all federal criminal charges not only to Epstein but also to four named co-conspirators and any unnamed, potential co-conspirators. Alan Dershowitz was involved in negotiating this agreement. Halt to FBI Probe 
the non-prosecution agreement effectively halted the ongoing FBI investigation into whether there were more victims and other influential individuals who were involved in Epstein's sex crimes. The agreement also sealed the indictment, preventing further legal action. Secrecy and Violation of Victims' Rights The Miami Herald reported that Acosta's decision to keep the deal secret essentially violated federal law and kept it hidden from Epstein's victims. Acosta later claimed that he was told Epstein belonged to intelligence, was above his pay grade, and was advised to leave it alone. Epstein's guilty plea as part of the agreement, Epstein agreed to plead guilty in Florida State Court to two felony prostitution charges. He was sentenced to serve 18 months in prison, required to register as a sex offender, and ordered to pay restitution to three dozen victims identified by the FBI. Judicial Review A federal judge later found that the prosecutors had violated the rights of victims by concealing the agreement from them and urging them to be patient. The plea deal was heavily criticized and described as a sweetheart deal. Department of Justice Review An internal review conducted by the Department of Justice's Office of Professional Responsibility, released in November 2020, found that Acosta had shown poor judgment in granting Epstein a non-prosecution agreement and failing to notify Epstein's alleged victims about the agreement. The NPA's handling and the perceived leniency of Epstein's sentence in this case sparked significant public controversy and debate. It continued to be a focal point of discussions and legal actions related to Epstein's criminal activities and the justice system's response to them. Between 2008 and 2011, Jeffrey Epstein faced legal proceedings, conviction, and sentencing. Here are the key details. Plea and Sentencing 2008 On June 30, 2008, Epstein pleaded guilty to a state charge of procuring prostitution from a girl below the age of 18. He was sentenced to 18 months in prison. While many convicted sex offenders in Florida are sent to state prison, Epstein served his time in a private wing of the Palm Beach County stockade. Work release and house arrest During his sentence, Epstein was allowed to leave jail on work release for up to 12 hours a day, six days a week. This was highly unusual and contrary to the sheriff's policies that limited the remaining sentence to 10 months and made sex offenders ineligible for such privileges. Epstein's cell door was left unlocked, and he had access to the attorney room with a television. He was allowed to work at his own foundation's office, which he dissolved after serving his time. The sheriff's office received financial contributions from Epstein's nonprofit to cover the extra costs of providing these services during his work release. He was also allowed to use his own driver for transportation between jail, his office, and other appointments. House arrest and probation Epstein was released on July 22, 2009, after serving almost 13 months. He was placed on house arrest for a year until August 2010. During this period, he was allowed multiple trips on his corporate jet to his residences in Manhattan and the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as shopping trips and walks around Palm Beach. Sex Offender Registration Following a hearing and appeal in January 2011, Epstein remained registered in New York State as a Level 3 sex offender, indicating a high risk of a repeat offense. He was required to personally check in with the New York Police Department every 90 days. Despite being a Level 3 sex offender, the NYPD did not enforce the 90-day regulation, although noncompliance is a felony. Reactions and Controversy The plea agreement and Epstein's lenient treatment led to significant controversy and public dispute. Critics argued that he received preferential treatment, and the Miami Herald reported that U.S. Attorney Acosta had given Epstein the deal of a lifetime. After Epstein's arrest in July 2019 on sex trafficking charges, Acosta resigned as Secretary of Labor. Several individuals and institutions returned donations received from Epstein, and there were questions surrounding charitable donations he had made to finance children's education. Alfredo Rodriguez, in June 2010, Epstein's former house manager, Alfredo Rodriguez, 
was sentenced to 18 months in incarceration for an obstruction charge. Rodriguez had failed to turn over a journal to the police and attempted to sell it. The journal contained information that would have been useful in investigating and prosecuting Epstein's case, including names and contact information of witnesses and additional victims. Epstein's lenient sentencing and the circumstances surrounding his jail term remained a source of public outrage and controversy in the years that followed. Here are the key details of civil cases related to Jeffrey Epstein. Jane Does v. Epstein, 2008 In February 2008, an anonymous Virginia woman known as Jane Doe No. 2 filed a $50 million civil lawsuit against Epstein. She claimed that when she was a 16-year-old minor in 2004 and 2005, she was recruited to give Epstein a massage. She alleged that she was taken to his mansion, where he exposed himself, engaged in sexual intercourse with her, and paid her $200 afterward. Another similar $50 million lawsuit was filed in March 2008 by a different woman represented by the same lawyer. Most of these lawsuits were dismissed, and Epstein settled many out of court. Victims' Rights, Jane Does v. United States, 2014 In December 2014, a federal civil lawsuit was filed in Florida by Jane Doe 1, Courtney Wilde, and Jane Doe 2 against the United States. The lawsuit alleged violations of the Crime Victims' Rights Act by the U.S. Department of Justice concerning the non-prosecution agreement with Epstein in 2008. There was an unsuccessful effort to add Virginia Roberts, Jane Doe 3, and another woman, Jane Doe 4, as plaintiffs to this case. The case also initially accused Alan Dershowitz of sexual abuse, but those allegations were stricken by the judge. The lawsuit aims to vacate the federal plea agreement on the grounds that it violated the rights of the victims. In a ruling on February 21, 2019, the judge stated that federal prosecutors violated the law by failing to notify victims before allowing Epstein to plead guilty to only two Florida offenses. These lawsuits and legal actions are part of the ongoing legal proceedings surrounding Jeffrey Epstein and his alleged crimes. Virginia Jufri v. Epstein, 2015 Virginia Jufri, formerly known as Virginia Roberts, alleged in a sworn affidavit that she had been sexually trafficked by Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell at the age of 17. She claimed that she had been used for sexual purposes by Epstein, Maxwell, and several others, including Prince Andrew and Alan Dershowitz. Jufri also alleged physical and sexual abuse by Epstein, Maxwell, and others and raised concerns about a potential FBI cover-up. She said she was Epstein's sex slave from 1999 to 2002 and had recruited other underage girls. Prince Andrew, Epstein, and Dershowitz all denied having had sexual contact with Jufri. Jufri filed a defamation suit against Dershowitz, claiming he made false and malicious statements about her. Epstein settled with Jufri out of court. Virginia Jufri v. Ghislaine Maxwell 2015 Following the allegations made by Virginia Jufri and comments made by Ghislaine Maxwell, Jufri filed a defamation suit against Maxwell in September 2015. The case was eventually settled under seal in May 2017. After an appeal, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit ordered the documents related to the 2017 defamation settlement to be unsealed. In Jufri's testimony, she claimed that Maxwell directed her to provide erotic massages and engage in sexual activities with various individuals, including Prince Andrew, John Luke Brunel, Glenn Dubin, Marvin Minsky, Governor Bill Richardson, and others. These depositions don't confirm that any of these individuals were involved in the alleged activities, and they have not been indicted or sued for related sex crimes. On August 9, 2019, just before Epstein's death, approximately 2,000 pages of sealed documents from the case were released. Some additional sealed documents may also be reviewed for potential public release. A John Doe sought to keep the documents permanently sealed, citing concerns about potential damage to his reputation, even though there was no evidence to suggest his name was included. 
These legal cases are part of the broader legal fallout related to the allegations against Epstein and those associated with him. Jane Doe v. Epstein and Trump, 2016 A federal lawsuit filed in California in April 2016, against Epstein and Donald Trump by a California woman alleged that the two men sexually assaulted her at a series of parties at Epstein's Manhattan residence in 1994 when she was 13 years old. The suit was dismissed by a federal judge in May 2016 because it did not raise valid claims under federal law. The woman filed another federal suit in New York in June 2016, but it was withdrawn three months later, apparently without being served on the defendants. A third federal suit was filed in New York in September 2016. The two latter suits included affidavits by an anonymous witness who attested to the accusations in the suits, asserting Epstein employed her to procure underage girls for him, and an anonymous person who declared the plaintiff had told him, or about the assaults at the time they occurred. The plaintiff, who had filed anonymously as Jane Doe, was scheduled to appear in a Los Angeles press conference six days before the 2016 election, but abruptly cancelled the event. Her lawyer Lisa Bloom asserted that the woman had received threats. The suit was dropped on November 4, 2016. Trump's attorney Alan Garten denied the allegations, while Epstein declined to comment. Sarah Ransom v. Epstein and Maxwell, 2017 In 2017, Sarah Ransom filed a suit against Epstein and Maxwell, alleging that Maxwell had hired her to give massages to Epstein and later threatened to physically harm her or destroy her career prospects if she did not comply with their sexual demands at his mansion in New York City and on his private Caribbean island, Little St. James. The suit was settled in 2018 under undisclosed terms. Bradley Edwards' Defamation v. Epstein, 2018 A state civil lawsuit in Florida filed by attorney Bradley Edwards against Epstein was scheduled for trial in December 2018. The trial was expected to provide victims with their first opportunity to make their accusations in public. However, the case was settled on the first day of the trial with Epstein publicly apologizing to Edwards, other terms of the settlement were confidential. Maria Farmer v. Epstein and Maxwell, 2019 On April 16, 2019, Maria Farmer went public and filed a sworn affidavit in federal court in New York, alleging that she and her 15-year-old sister, Annie, had been sexually assaulted by Epstein and Maxwell in separate locations in 1996. Farmer met Epstein and Maxwell at her graduate art gallery reception at the New York Academy of Art in 1995. The following year, in the summer of 1996, they hired her to work on an art project in Leslie Wexner's Ohio mansion, where she was then sexually assaulted. Farmer reported the incident to the New York City Police Department and the FBI. Farmer's affidavit also stated that during the same summer, Epstein flew her then 15-year-old sister to his New Mexico property where he and Maxwell sexually abused her on a massage table. Jennifer Arias v. Epstein and Maxwell, 2019 On July 22, 2019, while in jail awaiting trial, Epstein was served with a petition regarding a pending state civil lawsuit filed by Jennifer Arias. She stated that an associate for Epstein had recruited her outside talent unlimited high school at age 14 and she was gradually groomed for over a year before Epstein raped her in his New York City mansion when she was 15. Arias filed her suit on August 14, 2019, when New York state law was updated to allow one year for adult survivors of child sexual abuse to sue for previous offenses, regardless of how long ago the abuse took place. In October 2019, Arias amended her complaint to include over 20 corporate entities associated with Epstein and named the additional individuals Leslie Groff and Symboli Espinoza as enablers. Caitlin Doe, et al. v. Epstein's Estate, 2019 Three women, Caitlin Doe, Lisa Doe, and Priscilla Doe, sued the estate of Jeffrey Epstein on August 20, 2019. 
Two of the women were seventeen and one was twenty when they met Epstein. The women alleged they were recruited, subjected to unwanted sex acts, and controlled by Epstein and a vast enterprise of co-conspirators. Jane Doe v. Epstein's Estate, 2019 A New York accuser of Epstein, known only as Jane Doe, announced a federal lawsuit against his estate in the Southern District of New York on September 18, 2019, stating that she was recruited in 2002 and sexually abused by Epstein for three years starting at age 14. Teresa Helm, et al. v. Epstein's Estate, 2019 Five women, Teresa Helm, Annie Farmer, Maria Farmer, Juliet Bryant, and an unidentified woman, represented by David Boies, sued Epstein's estate in Federal District Court in Manhattan in November 2019, accusing him of rape, battery and false imprisonment and seeking unspecified damages. Jane Doe 15 v. Epstein's estate, 2019 On November 18, 2019, a woman identified as Jane Doe 15 made a public appearance with her attorney Gloria Allred to announce that she was suing the estate of Jeffrey Epstein in the District Court for the Southern District of New York, alleging that he manipulated, trafficked, and sexually abused her in 2004, when she was 15 years old. Tila Davies v. Epstein's Estate, 2019 On November 21, 2019, Tila Davies appeared with her attorney Gloria Allred and announced her lawsuit in Manhattan Federal Court against Epstein's estate. Davies stated that after meeting Epstein in 2002, he sexually assaulted and trafficked her in New York, New Mexico, Florida, the Virgin Islands, and France. Jane Does 1-9 v. Epstein's estate, 2019 On December 3, 2019, Lawyer Jordan Merson filed a lawsuit in New York on behalf of nine anonymous accusers, Jane Does 1-9, and against Epstein's estate for battery, assault, and intentional emotional distress. The claims date from 1985 through the 2000s, and include individuals who were 13, 14, and 15 when they first encountered Epstein. J.J. Doe v. Epstein's Estate, 2019 the lawsuit was filed by Bradley Edwards on behalf of his client in late December 2019. The accuser, J.J. Doe, is described as being a 14-year-old resident of Palm Beach County at the time Epstein abused her in 2004. U.S. Virgin Islands v. Epstein's Estate, et al., 2020 a lawsuit was filed in the Superior Court of the U.S. Virgin Islands in January 2020 alleging that Epstein ran a sex trafficking conspiracy for over two decades, through 2018, with children as young as 11 years old on Epstein's Caribbean islands. According to Attorney General Denise George, his alleged criminal activities on the islands were concealed through a complex network of companies. Jane Doe v. Maxwell and Epstein's Estate, 2020 in January 2020, a lawsuit was filed against Maxwell and Epstein alleging that they recruited a 13-year-old music student at the Interlochen Center for the Arts in 1994 and subjected her to sexual abuse. The suit states that Jane Doe was repeatedly sexually assaulted by Epstein over a four-year period and that Maxwell played a key role in both her recruitment and by participating in the assaults. Jane Does v. Epstein Estate, 2020 in August 2020, Nine Jane Does filed suit accusing Epstein of sexual abuse. The alleged victims in the lawsuit include an 11 and 13 year old and a victim who alleged abuse in 1975. Jane Doe v. Epstein Estate, 2020. In August 2020, Epstein was sued by Jane Doe accusing him of sexually abusing her for over a year, beginning when she was 18 years old. Kelly Brennan v. Epstein Estate, 2021 A civil suit was filed against Epstein's estate in 2021 by Long Island native, Kelly Brennan, who accused Epstein of sexually assaulting her at a club restaurant in New York City called Cipriani. She accused Epstein of brutally raping and torturing her in his Manhattan residence in 2003. Jane Doe v. Epstein Estate, 2021 
A civil suit was filed against Epstein's estate in March 2021 by a Broward County woman who accused Epstein and Maxwell of trafficking her after repeatedly raping her in Florida in 2008. On July 6, 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was arrested by the FBEN YPD Crimes Against Children Task Force at Teterboro Airport in New Jersey on sex trafficking charges. Following his arrest, he was jailed at the Metropolitan Correctional Center in New York City. At the time of Epstein's arrest, approximately a dozen FBI agents forced open the door to his Manhattan townhouse, known as the Herbert N. Strauss House, with search warrants. The search of his townhouse yielded evidence related to sex trafficking, including hundreds, and perhaps thousands, of sexually suggestive photographs of fully, or partially, nude females. Some of these photographs were confirmed to be of underage females. In a locked safe, they discovered $70,000 in cash, 48 diamonds, and a fraudulent Austrian passport that had Epstein's photo but a different name and had expired in 1987. The passport had various entrance and exit stamps, indicating its use for international travel to France, Spain, the United Kingdom, and Saudi Arabia in the 1980s, with his place of residence listed as Saudi Arabia. According to Epstein's attorneys, he had acquired the passport because he believed that, as an affluent member of the Jewish faith, he was at risk of being kidnapped while traveling abroad. On July 8, Epstein was charged with sex trafficking and conspiracy to traffic minors for sex by prosecutors with the Public Corruption Unit of the Southern District of New York. The grand jury indictment alleged that, Dozens of underage girls were brought into Epstein's mansions for sexual encounters. Epstein requested to be released on bond and offered to post $100 million with the condition that he would submit to house arrest in his New York City mansion. However, U.S. District Judge Richard M. Berman denied the request on July 18, stating that Epstein posed a danger to the public and was a significant flight risk to avoid prosecution. Tragically, on August 10, 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was found dead in his jail cell. Nineteen days later, on August 29, 2019, the case against Epstein was closed by Judge Berman. Prosecutors stated they would continue to investigate potential co-conspirators. Epstein's death in jail was ruled a suicide. On August 23, 2019, the prosecutor's office in Paris, France, initiated a preliminary investigation into Jeffrey Epstein. This investigation aims to explore allegations related to rape and sexual assault of minors, both under and over the age of 15, as well as potential charges of criminal association with the intent to commit crimes and association with criminals with the intent to commit offenses. The focus of this investigation is to determine whether any crimes linked to Epstein were committed in France or involved French citizens. Personal life Previous long-term girlfriends associated with Epstein include Eva Anderson Dubin and publishing heiress Ghislaine Maxwell. Epstein was romantically linked to Anderson Dubin for an 11-year period mostly in the 1980s and the two later remained friendly well after her marriage to Glenn Dubin. Epstein met Maxwell, daughter of disgraced media baron Robert Maxwell, in 1991. Epstein had Maxwell come to the United States in 1991 to recover from her grief following the death of her father. Maxwell was implicated by several of Epstein's accusers as procuring or recruiting underage girls in addition to once being Epstein's girlfriend. In a 2009 deposition, Several of Epstein's household employees testified that Maxwell had a central role in both his public and private life, referring to her as his main girlfriend, who also handled the hiring, supervising, and firing of staff starting around 1992. In 1995, Epstein renamed one of his companies the Ghislaine Corporation in Palm Beach, Florida. The company was dissolved in 1998. In 2000, Maxwell moved into a 7,000-square-foot townhouse, less than 10 blocks from Epstein's New York mansion. This townhome was purchased for $4.95 million by an anonymous limited liability company, with an address that matches the office of J. Epstein & Company. 
representing the buyer was Darren Indyke, Epstein's longtime lawyer. In a 2003 Vanity Fair expose, Epstein refers to Maxwell as my best friend. Epstein was a longtime acquaintance of Prince Andrew and Tom Barak and attended parties with many prominent people, including Bill Clinton, George Stephanopoulos, Donald Trump, Katie Couric, Woody Allen, and Harvey Weinstein. His contacts included Rupert Murdoch, Michael Bloomberg, Richard Branson, Michael Jackson, Alec Baldwin, and the Kennedys. His contacts also included Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak, British Prime Minister Tony Blair, and Saudi Arabian Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. Both Clinton and Trump claimed that they never visited Epstein's island. Epstein was associated with former Trump chief strategist Steve Bannon. According to Michael Wolff, Bannon and Epstein were introduced in December 2017. Bannon met with Epstein several times at his mansion in New York. Also according to Wolf, Bannon coached Epstein for a 60 Minutes interview which never occurred. A New York Times article reported that Bill Gates's relationship with Jeffrey Epstein started in 2011, just a few years after Epstein's conviction, and continued for some years. In August 2021, Gates said the reason he had meetings with Epstein was because Gates hoped Epstein could provide money for philanthropic work, though nothing came of the idea. Gates added, it was a huge mistake to spend time with him, to give him the credibility of being there. Epstein owned a private Boeing 727 jet and traveled in it frequently, logging 600 flying hours a year, usually with guests on board. The jet was nicknamed the Lolita Express by the locals in the Virgin Islands because of its frequent arrivals at Little St. James with apparently underage girls. In 2003, Epstein flew to Cuba aboard his plane with Colombian President Andres Pastrana Arango at the invitation of Cuban President Fidel Castro. According to Fabiola Santiago of the Miami Herald, Epstein was likely considering relocating to Cuba in order to escape U.S. law enforcement. Epstein was under investigation by U.S. law enforcement at the time. In 2009, Epstein's brother Mark claimed Trump had flown on Epstein's plane at least once. He later told the Washington Post that Trump flew numerous times on Epstein's airplane, although Mark was present on only one of the flights. According to Michael Corcoran, Trump flew Epstein on his own airplane at least once. In September 2002, Epstein flew Clinton, Kevin Spacey, and Chris Tucker to Africa in this jet. Flight records obtained in 2016 show Bill Clinton flew 27 times to at least a dozen international locations. In a profile of Epstein in New York Magazine in 2002 Donald Trump remarked, I've known Jeff for 15 years. Terrific guy. He's a lot of fun to be with. It is even said that he likes beautiful women as much as I do, and many of them are on the younger side. No doubt about it, Jeffrey enjoys his social life. In July 2019, Trump said, I knew him like everybody in Palm Beach knew him, stating four times he had not been a fan of Epstein and that he had not spoken to him in about 15 years. A video shot in 1992 surfaced showing the two men partying together at Mar-a-Lago. By 2007, Trump reportedly banned Epstein from his Mar-a-Lago club for unseemly pursuit of young females. The ban allegation was included in court documents filed by attorney Bradley Edwards, although Edwards later said it was a rumor he tried to, but could not, confirm. In 2002, a spokesman of Bill Clinton lauded Epstein as a committed philanthropist, with insights and generosity. At the time Epstein was on the board of Rockefeller University, a member of the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations, and was a major donor to Harvard University. Epstein visited the White House while Clinton was president on four known occasions. In 1993, he went to a donor event at the White House with his companion Ghislaine Maxwell. Around the same time, he also met with President Clinton's aide Mark Middleton on at least three occasions at the White House. In 1995, financier Lynn Forrester discussed Jeffrey Epstein and currency stabilization with Clinton. 
Epstein, according to his own accounts, was heavily involved in the foreign exchange market and traded large amounts of currency in the unregulated forex market. In 1995, Epstein also attended a small political fundraiser dinner for Bill Clinton which included 14 other people including Ron Perelman, Don Johnson, Jimmy Buffett, and dinner organizer Paul Prosperi. From the 1990s to the mid-2000s, Epstein often socialized with the future President Donald Trump. Author Michael Wolff wrote that Trump, Epstein, and Tom Barak were at the time like a set of nightlife musketeers on the social scene. Epstein and Trump socialized both in New York City and Palm Beach, where they both had houses. In April 2003, New York Magazine reported Epstein hosted a dinner party in his Manhattan residence to honor Bill Clinton, who did not attend, although Trump did attend. According to the Washington Post, one person who knew Epstein and Trump during this time noted that they were tight and they were each other's wingmen. In November 2004, Epstein and Trump's friendship ran into trouble when they became embroiled in a bidding war for a $40 million mansion, Maison de Lamity, which was being auctioned in Palm Beach. Trump won the auction for $41 million, and successfully sold the property four years later for $95 million to the Russian billionaire Dmitry Rybolovlov. That month was the last time Epstein and Trump were recorded to have interacted. The exact origin of Jeffrey Epstein's wealth remains unknown. However, it is believed that Leslie Wexner and Robert Maxwell played roles in helping him accumulate his initial wealth. When Epstein pleaded guilty to charges related to soliciting and procuring prostitution in 2008, his lawyers claimed that he was a billionaire with a net worth of over $1 billion. Nevertheless, there have been doubts about the extent of his wealth, with some sources questioning his status as a billionaire. Epstein reportedly lost significant amounts of money during the 2008 financial crisis, and many of his associates, including Leslie Wexner, distanced themselves from him following his guilty plea to prostitution charges in 2008. Some articles, including one in the New York Times and another in Forbes, expressed skepticism about Epstein's true financial status, suggesting that his wealth may have been exaggerated. Spencer Cuban, an attorney representing some of Epstein's alleged victims, and an investigation by the Miami Herald into the Swiss leaks documents revealed that much of Epstein's wealth was kept in offshore accounts. These documents indicated that he had multiple financial accounts with millions of dollars in offshore tax havens. According to federal prosecutors, Epstein was described as extravagantly wealthy, with assets worth at least $500 million and annual earnings of more than $10 million, based on records from one financial institution. However, the full extent of his wealth was unclear since he had not provided a financial affidavit for his bail application. In 2020, Epstein's estate paid out nearly $50 million to over 100 women who filed claims with the Epstein Victims Compensation Fund, established in the U.S. Virgin Islands. By February 2021, the estate's value was approximately $240 million, a significant decrease from estimates of $630 million the previous year. This drop in value led the Attorney General of the U.S. Virgin Islands to seek an immediate asset freeze, alleging that the estate executors had mismanaged the money. Jeffrey Epstein owned several notable residences and properties, including Herbert N. Strauss House, 9, East 71st Street, Manhattan, New York Epstein's most famous residence, this mansion was originally purchased by his mentor, Leslie Wexner, in 1989 for $13.2 million. Epstein moved into the mansion in 1995, and in 1998, he paid Wexner $20 million for full ownership. It was valued at $77 million by federal prosecutors in 2019, making it one of the largest private residences in Manhattan, covering 21,000 square feet. The mansion featured unique elements such as a lead-lined bathroom with closed-circuit television screens, a heated sidewalk, and rows of individually framed prosthetic eyeballs. Palm Beach, Florida Epstein owned a residence in Palm Beach, Florida, which he purchased in 1990. 22. 
Avenue Foch, Paris, France, Epstein had seven units in an apartment building near the Arc de Triomphe at 22, Avenue Foch in Paris, France. Zorro Ranch, near Stanley, New Mexico Epstein purchased this 7,500-acre ranch in 1993. Little St. James, U.S. Virgin Islands Epstein owned a private island near St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, which included a mansion and guest houses. He purchased it in 1998. Great St. James, U.S. Virgin Islands Epstein acquired the neighboring island of Great St. James in 2016. He was in the process of building a compound on this island, including an amphitheater and an underwater office and pool, but work ran into issues with a stop work order issued in late 2018. 34, East 69th Street, Manhattan, New York, Epstein lived in this spacious townhouse from 1992 to 1995. The townhouse was a former Iranian government building taken over by the State Department during the Iranian Revolution. Columbus, Ohio, Epstein previously owned a mansion outside Columbus, Ohio, near Leslie Wexner's home, which he purchased from Wexner. Villard House, 457, Madison Avenue Epstein rented offices at the Villard House for his business dealings, where he conducted his financial operations until at least 2003. 301, East 66th Street, Manhattan, New York, Epstein rented multiple apartment units at this address for his employees, models, and guests. Some of these units were owned by Asa Properties, which belonged to Epstein's brother, Mark. This complex was used to house various individuals over the years, including friends, employees, and, at times, underage girls. These properties were part of Epstein's expansive real estate portfolio, which came under scrutiny following the allegations of sexual abuse against him. Jeffrey Epstein made a series of political donations and philanthropic contributions during his lifetime. Political Donations From 1989 until 2003, Epstein donated more than $139,000 to U.S. Democratic Party federal candidates and committees and over $18,000 to U.S. Republican Party candidates and groups. In 2002 and 2006, Epstein contributed $50,000 to Democrat Bill Richardson's successful campaigns for governor of New Mexico. He donated $15,000 to Democrat Gary King's successful campaign for Attorney General of New Mexico in 2006. He also contributed $35,000 to King's 2014 unsuccessful campaign for governor. Other contributions in New Mexico included $10,000 toward Jim Backa's campaign to become head of the Land Commission and $2,000 toward Santa Fe County Sheriff Jim Solano's bid for re-election. In 2010, Epstein received a notice from the New Mexico Department of Public Safety, stating, You are not required to register, as a sex offender, with the state of New Mexico, which contradicted federal law. Philanthropy in 1991, Epstein was one of the donors who pledged to raise $2 million for a Hillel student building, Rosovsky Hall, at Harvard University. In the 1990s, Epstein donated $10,000 to the White House Historical Association. In 2000, Epstein established the Jeffrey Epstein Six Foundation, which funds science research and education. Epstein pledged a series of donations totaling $30 million to create a mathematical biology and evolutionary dynamics program at Harvard University, which was run by Martin Nowak. The actual amount received from Epstein was reported to be $6.5 million. Epstein was part of the original group that conceived the Clinton Global Initiative, according to attorney Gerald B. Lefcourt. Epstein co-organized a science event called the Mind Shift Conference with illusionist and skeptic Al Sekel, which took place on his private island, Little St. James, in 2010. Epstein made charitable donations through his three private charities, Epstein Interest, the CUQ Foundation, and Gratitude American Limited federal tax filings show that he donated $30 million between 1998 and 2018 through these charities. Epstein's philanthropic activities have faced scrutiny and criticism due to concerns over transparency and his criminal activities. 
Following his death, several institutions and individuals faced backlash for accepting money from Epstein and his foundation, with some offering to donate or give away funds associated with him. Jeffrey Epstein developed a strong interest in eugenics and transhumanism, focusing on improving the human race through genetic engineering and artificial intelligence. His interest in these fields became prominent in the early 2000s. He addressed the scientific community at various events and occasions, expressing his fascination with eugenics. It was reported in August 2019 that Epstein had plans to seed the human race with his DNA by impregnating multiple women simultaneously at his New Mexico compound, essentially creating a baby ranch where mothers would give birth to his offspring. He was also an advocate of cryonics and had his own version of transhumanism. He stated that he intended to have his penis and head frozen after his death. Epstein's interest in these topics raised ethical concerns, and experts in the field of science and bioethics expressed reservations about accepting funding from him if they were aware of his plans for eugenics experiments. Professor George Church, for instance, publicly apologized for meeting Epstein after his 13-month sentence and acknowledged the need for more significant ethical discussions around accepting support from individuals with controversial agendas. On July 23, 2019, Jeffrey Epstein was found injured and semi-conscious in his cell at the Metropolitan Correctional Center, MCC, with marks around his neck. His cellmate, Nicholas Tartaglione, a former New York City police officer awaiting trial for murder charges, was questioned about Epstein's condition and denied any knowledge of what had occurred. Correctional staff suspected it was a possible suicide attempt but did not rule out the possibility of it being staged or an assault by another inmate. Following this incident, Epstein was placed on suicide watch. Six days later, on July 29, 2019, Epstein was taken off suicide watch and placed in a special housing unit with another inmate. However, on the night of his death, certain standard procedures were not followed. Despite being informed that Epstein would have a cellmate and be checked on every 30 minutes, no one was placed in his cell, and he was not checked as regularly as required. Two cameras in front of Epstein's cell also malfunctioned on that night. Jeffrey Epstein was found dead in his cell at MCC on August 10, 2019, at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The Bureau of Prisons initiated life-saving measures immediately upon discovering his body, and he was transported to a hospital. On that day, the Bureau of Prisons and U.S. Attorney General William Barr described Epstein's death as an apparent suicide, although a final determination had not been made. An investigation by the U.S. Department of Justice's Inspector General released on June 27, 2023, criticized jail officials for negligence, misconduct, and job performance failures related to Epstein's incarceration and death. The report refuted suggestions that Epstein's death was anything other than a suicide. On August 11, 2019, an autopsy was conducted on Jeffrey Epstein's body. The autopsy revealed that Epstein had sustained multiple breaks in his neck bones. One of the broken bones was the hyoid bone. While it is possible for these types of injuries to occur in cases of hangings, they are more commonly associated with victims of homicide by strangulation. For example, a 2010 study found broken hyoids in 25% of cases of hangings, and a larger study conducted from 2010 to 2016 found hyoid damage in just 6% of cases of hangings. These types of fractures are more common with age, as bones become more brittle. On August 16, 2019, the New York City medical examiner, Barbara Sampson, ruled Epstein's death as a suicide by hanging. However, Epstein's defense lawyers were not satisfied with this conclusion and launched their own independent investigation into the cause of Epstein's death. They sought access to the camera footage near Epstein's cell during the night of his death. Epstein's lawyers believed that the evidence surrounding his death was more consistent with murder than suicide. Michael Baden, an independent pathologist hired by the Epstein estate, was present at the autopsy. 
In October 2019, Baden stated that Epstein had experienced a number of injuries, including a broken bone in his neck, which were highly unusual in cases of suicidal hangings and could more commonly indicate homicidal strangulation. He suggested that the evidence pointed toward homicide rather than suicide. After Jeffrey Epstein's death, several developments and investigations took place. Last Will and Testament Epstein signed his last will and testament on August 8, 2019, two weeks after being found injured in his cell and two days before his death. The will named two longtime employees as executors and gifted all of his assets, along with any assets remaining in his estate, to a trust. Burial Following the autopsy, Epstein's body was claimed by his brother Mark. On September 5, 2019, Epstein's body was buried in an unmarked grave next to his parents at the I.J. Morris Star of David Cemetery in Palm Beach, Florida. The names of his parents were also removed from their tombstone to prevent vandalism. Investigations Attorney General William Barr ordered an investigation by the Department of Justice Inspector General, in addition to the FBI's investigation, expressing his dismay over Epstein's death in federal custody. Barr stated that there were serious irregularities in the prison's handling of Epstein and vowed to hold those responsible accountable. Judge Richard M. Berman, overseeing Epstein's criminal case, inquired whether the investigation into Epstein's apparent suicide would include an examination of his prior injuries. The Council of Prison Locals C-33's national president, E. O. Young, mentioned that prisons couldn't prevent determined suicides, and he raised questions about the presence of video footage and direct observations of Epstein's hanging. President Serene Gregg of the American Federation of Government Employees Local 3148 highlighted that the MCC had a shortage of correctional officers, leading to mandatory overtime and long workweeks for the staff. Epstein's attorneys asked Judge Berman to investigate their client's death, suggesting they could provide evidence that the incident resulting in his death was more consistent with assault than suicide. Reports emerged that some camera footage outside Epstein's cell was unusable, while two cameras that malfunctioned were sent to an FBI crime lab for examination. Federal prosecutors subpoenaed up to 20 correctional officers regarding the cause of Epstein's death. On November 19, 2019, Federal prosecutors charged two Metropolitan Correctional Center guards, Michael Thomas and Tova Noel, with creating false records and conspiracy. Video footage revealed that Epstein had been in his cell unchecked for eight hours before being found dead, which violated regulations. On May 22, 2021, both guards admitted they falsified records but were spared from incarceration as part of a deferred prosecution agreement. They pleaded guilty to falsifying records and conspiracy and received sentences of six months of supervisory release and 100 hours of community service. Jeffrey Epstein's life, death, and the controversies surrounding it have been the subject of significant attention in popular culture. Here are some notable instances. HBO Limited Series HBO is creating a limited series on Epstein's life and death, which will be directed and executive produced by Adam McKay. Sony Pictures Television Miniseries Sony Pictures Television is also developing a miniseries based on Epstein's life. The Good Fight, the CBS series, The Good Fight, featured a plot revolving around Epstein's death in the season 4 finale. Netflix Documentary Series, Jeffrey Epstein, Filthy Rich, is a documentary series that premiered on Netflix in May 2020. It delves into Epstein's life and the allegations against him. Lifetime Documentary, Surviving Jeffrey Epstein, is a documentary that premiered on Lifetime in August 2020, focusing on the stories of Epstein's survivors and the broader context of his actions. Statue in Albuquerque, a statue of Epstein appeared in Albuquerque, New Mexico, on July 1, 2020, sparking attention in debate. Borat's subsequent movie film, footage of Donald Trump and Jeffrey Epstein talking at a 1992 Mar-a-Lago party is featured in the 2020 comedy mockumentary, Borat's subsequent movie film. 
In the film, the footage is humorously used to inspire Borat to gift his teen daughter to someone in Trump's inner circle. Additionally, the belief that Epstein's death was a homicide became a popular meme, and there has been ongoing debate and speculation about the circumstances of his death. In life and in death, Jeffrey Epstein's name remains synonymous with scandal, controversy, and intrigue. From his early days in finance to the shocking allegations of sexual abuse and exploitation, Epstein's story has left an indelible mark on the public consciousness. His mysterious death in a federal jail cell only added to the enigma surrounding him, fueling countless debates and conspiracy theories. The fallout from his actions continues, with investigations, lawsuits, and the pursuit of justice for his victims ongoing. Whether remembered as a financier, a philanthropist, a criminal, or a symbol of privilege and abuse, Jeffrey Epstein's complex legacy continues to captivate and haunt the public imagination, serving as a stark reminder of the enduring questions and controversies that surround his life and death.